Today we're going to talk about the Elijah ministry, which is the answer to Sister Jezebel. But let's don't call her sister. Uh, I hope she's not our sister. The Jezebel influence and the Jezebel spirits have invaded every area of life. They've gone into the business world, they've gone into the political system, social, economic, educational, and even more deadly, they're into the religious world, and that's where the damage is really done. Because until she's rooted out of the, of the uh, um, religious sector, there's not much way to deal with Jezebel. Because spiritual power is behind the Jezebel influence and the Jezebel spirits, and it's going to take real spiritual power to knock Jezebel out of the saddle. Last night we talked about Jezebel rides again, and the thing that will pick her out of the saddle is the Elijah ministry, and that's what we want to talk about today. Elijah is always sort of your hero, isn't he? He's the prophet of fire. And you read about Elijah, you can't help but kind of get stirred up and be glad you're on that side. Amen? And there's something really exciting about Elijah. He was a strange old codger. Weird. He didn't fit his generation at all. He starts off in, uh, well, you get an introduction to him. In 1 Kings 17, the first chapter, he pops in front of the king and said, guess what? There's going to be a drought. And then God says, you come with me quickly, and I'm going to hide you. And the drought hits. Now, just like most of the time, when people are warned about impending danger, they first tend to brush it aside, and especially if they're as carnal as a billy goat like Ahab was. And, of course, Ahab wasn't going to pay any attention to a stupid thing like some dumb prophet coming out who listens to a preacher anyhow, you know, especially a wild-eyed one like that. I don't even read that Elijah had a congregation anywhere. He wasn't even successful. I don't read that he built a building or anything else. But he was a prophet of the Lord. And he spoke with great authority. And when he lowered the boom on Ahab in 17.1, he said, as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there will not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. That's it. He didn't give him a long discourse on why he shouldn't have brought Jezebel into the land. He didn't give him a long lecture on the abuses and the horror of having the re religious system of Baal hooked into the political system. He didn't give a long list of all the horror stories that were going on in the marriages as a result of this amalgamation of heathenism and filth and ungodliness roped into the system to destroy God's people. He simply, look at the message he gave him. Time it. As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word, shortest sermon I ever heard, and then off he went, and he turned and walked out, and the word of the Lord came to him and said, Now you go, get away from here, <laughs> and you go and hide yourself to the east by the brook Cherith that's before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the Marriott Catering Services to bring you food twice a day there. No, he didn't do that. The Raven Express was bringing the food. Now, ravens are first cousins to buzzards, for your information, if you didn't know that. And if I were picking a carrier, I don't think I would have chosen the raven to bring me bread and flesh. But that's exactly what happened. And uh, so you see that Elijah had learned another lesson. You take what God sends. And boy, that isn't always the greatest, is it? And uh, <clears throat> some of you are married to what God sent. And, uh, but at any rate, <laughs> sorry, Rudy, I didn't want to destroy the ideal you painted up here a while ago. <laughs> There's a streak of wickedness in me that slips out every once in a while. Uh, but if you were choosing, you wouldn't have picked the Raven Express to deliver your food. 
And that's a good lesson for us, too. I don't find a lot of just saying, I'd like to register a complaint, Lord. Uh, the catering service you hired, uh, it, you know, it's kind of substandard. I don't recall anybody else having to eat what the birds brought, especially ravens. They nasty. How do I know they washed their beaks and their feet before they brought me my food? <laughs> they might not be ceremonially clean. As a matter of fact, where did they get the flesh? I've often wondered about that. Of course, I've been in Indonesia where I've eaten some things without question. <laughs> I figured it'd be better if I didn't know what I was eating. Of course, now, Rob went with me, and he was a little rebellious because, actually, he explained to me, the Lord, I said, but you're supposed to eat what's set before you, and he said, it doesn't say how much. <laughs> and you see that big man fill his plate, and I'm telling you, a little bird wouldn't get strangled on what he put on his plate and some of those things, especially if he didn't know what it was. <laughs> but we're going to have to learn to take things on God's terms. And one of the things, one of the reasons I think God sent the ravens is just exactly that. It was an humbling experience. I mean, I think here come these old big black flappy birds. Nasty things circling. Oh Lord, here comes breakfast. Did you bring me a Denver omelet? You didn't, though. Well, what did you bring? Well, they brought, they brought bread and flesh. And I've offered, uh, well, like I said, I, I hate to speculate about what the flesh was. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to ask Elijah when I get to heaven, and I think I can be, be able to bear it better then. If I knew now, I might back out. Um, it might run all the potential Elijahs out of business. But at any rate, he was brought subsistence food, whatever it was. It was able to sustain him, and he was fed twice a day, and he had water out of the brook. Now, all you fellows, can you imagine having two meals a day, bread and flesh, and a great healthy drink of water, whoopee. What a delicious diet. But Elijah stayed there, morning and night, verse 6. And it came to pass then that the brook dried up. Uh-oh. Everything is nice. Did you ever do that? You get out on a place, you've obeyed the Lord, you've taken your stand, and you've delivered your message to Ahab and said, Here, this is it. And you've turned and walked away and said, That's it, Lord. And he said, Get thee over here. I'm going to take care of you. And you <clears throat> look and you say, Well, <laughs> it's not exactly the Waldorf, but I guess it'll do. That's what the Lord wants. You settle down and you say, well, praise the Lord. He's supplying and it's coming in. And it's, it's not much of a job, but it is a job. And we are able to survive. And, and then all of a sudden, the, the brook runs dry. Now, what you going to do when the brook runs dry? What you going to do, Elijah, when the brook runs dry? Well, what do you do before? See, the rain dried up, just like you said. And pretty soon the brook dried up. And then the word of the Lord comes to him again. And the Lord said, Arise and go to Zarephath. I've commanded a widow to feed you there. Well, now widows obviously didn't have much. So again, he's not going to go in style. He's just going to go to subsistence level. And he goes there and here's this widow. And she has a little bit of meal in her barrel and a little, uh, just enough oil to mix it together and make a little old, well, I guess we'd call it a tortilla or something, a corn cake on the stove on her griddle there. Just enough for her and her son to have one more meal and then they're just going to sit down and die because all the food's gone out of the whole land. And he walks up and he said, make me a cake first. Well, you big galoot. Here's this poor woman and her little boy, and she's fixing to make the last meal for them. And he walks up and said, give it to me. Sounds selfish, doesn't it? But you know, that's what God told him. And when he did what God told him, this widow said, I can't do that. I just have this much. He said, well, just make me one first. And you know, the strange thing about this, this widow did what he said. 
That's always that's always been a strange one to me, you know. Why this here this bird walks in out of the out of the desert or wherever and walks up to her door. I don't know if she'd ever seen him or not. And he asked for this food and she feels that she has to do it. And she did it. And guess what? When she went back to see what was left, the cruise of oil was suddenly full. And there was meal in the barrel. And there never was a lack after that. They had plenty while everybody else had nothing. And God made that thing stretch and restretch. And it was an amazing miracle of God. Now what's God doing? He's getting the prophet ready. He's already given him a call. He's already giving him boldness beyond his, those of his peers because there were other prophets in the land. There were at least a hundred other prophets of God. That's why we're going to find them hid in two caves. They weren't doing much good. They were depending on the hand of Obadiah, not the hand of the Lord. Elijah was the one, though, that God was going to do something special with. When God's going to do something special with you, you get special treatment. You may think that you're being destroyed. I'm sure this must have seemed that way to Elijah. He was all by himself, and that's bad. You're lonesome. And um, he, um, he had to depend on the ravens. Now he's depending on a widow. Well, what's God doing to him? He's showing him his power. He spoke the message to, ah to Ahab. Then God honored his message, and the rain stopped. And they didn't even have any dew. And everything was drying up. All the water sources drying up completely. And the widow, the miracle of the widow. See what's happening? It's getting closer and closer. He's getting Elijah ready for something. And now then, there's going to be a climactic thing because one day he comes in and the little boy, the widow's little boy is dead. He comes in and she's weeping and crying. And she's saying, my son is dead. My son is dead. What did Elijah do? He went in. He said, give her, give me the boy. That's in verse 19, chapter 17 of 1 Kings. And he said, uh, well, she says in 18, What have I to do with thee? O thou man of God, art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? He said, is that why you came? To remind me of my sin and to kill my boy? She's beside herself with grief. And he said, give me thy son. He took him out of her bosom, carried him up into a loft where he abode. Uh, he had the penthouse. Only it was just the attic, really. But, uh, and he laid him on his own bed, and he cried to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, Hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? He said, Lord, what on earth is going on here? This woman has done good by me, and here her son's dead. Why, what's this all about? And he stretched himself on the child three times and cried to the Lord, and said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's life come into him again. Verse 22, and the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. This is training people. This is training school. It's rough. It's rough when you come in and everything's falling apart. It's rough when your cherished plans are smashed. When you're doing right and it all wipes out. Everything was so nice at the widow's house and suddenly it was gone. Suddenly there was, there was calamity where there'd been peace and joy and thanksgiving to the Lord. Now there's grieving and misery and he cries out to the Lord and the Lord hear, hears him and the Lord the soul of the child came into him again and he revived Elijah took the child brought him down out of the chamber of the house delivered him to his mother and Elijah said see thy son liveth now why did God do this he's teaching Elijah I've got more power all you have to do is ask me He's getting him ready for a confrontation that's going to destroy a system that Jezebel has worked diligently with, has poured unlimited money and effort and funds and people into to establish. 
And this one man is going to be the cornerstone that's going to turn this whole thing over and pray fruit basket. Did you ever pray fruit basket turn over? It used to be a game, you know, that you'd play. And we were kids. You'd get everybody and somebody who looked like, what's that? So you hadn't had any fun. Uh, you sit in a big circle around the room. Everybody sits there, you know. And, and you go around. And the person that's it, they go around. And they give everybody the name of a fruit. And uh, an apple, orange, grape, and all this kind of, I always got watermelon. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, then a uh, the person walks around in the center of the room. And they, they just call out one after the other. And each one that's called has to get up and walk around in a circle behind. You say, well, that sounds kind of silly. It is. Most games are silly. But uh, anyway, they walk around in a circle, you know. And then uh, they get a bunch of them out of the chairs, walking around, walking around. And then all of a sudden they say, fruit basket, turn over. And when they say that, boy, there's a mad scramble. You get any chair you can. And, of course, they've thoughtfully removed one of the chairs. Or at least, wait a minute, the person is it. They, he's the extra person, so there's going to be ones out. And then they go round, round, round. But every time, you, uh, every time you say fruit basket, turn over, that means everybody has to change chairs. Well, Elijah's going to holler, fruit basket, turn over in a little while. And God's turning him that all he has to do is call the power of God in, and the fruit basket will turn over. And that's exactly what's coming. And God is training in everything that's happening to you. If you're walking with Jesus, if you're trying to follow him the best you know how, everything that's happening to you, every trial you're going through, every privation, every financial deprivation, every reverse, Every person that spits in your face and says, I hate your guts, and don't ever speak to me again. Everybody that turns you out the door. Now, some of this is coming because you've acted a fool. And don't credit God with that part. But I'm talking about those things that you're really are strictly because you're trying to walk with Jesus and be a blessing. And you, uh, that's the kind that really hurt the worst, you know, when they turn on you for no reason. You haven't hurt anybody. And... Uh, They'll turn and cut you to pieces. And you say, how do you know? Sometime I'll show you the scars of where the knives are placed, of people that you trust and you clean. But I'll tell you this, if you're going to be used of God, there is no way that you're going to be able to escape this. You're going through training. Absolutely, everything that happens to you, God is going to use it you say, well, I don't see how this could help. I remember one time years and years ago when I was young and tender, uh, I was going through a terrible trial and I turned to an older, more mature Christian. I expected them to feel so sorry for me, you know, and everything. And they were just downright hateful. They just said, well, that's just part of the training, you know. When you follow Jesus, you're supposed to die. I thought, well, that's a lot of help. Here I'm crying and moaning in an awful heap of wounded everything, and, uh, and they're telling me, well, that's just what you have to expect. But you know, that's true. If you're going to be used of Jesus, you're going to have to go through the mill and everything that happens. And, and the thing that made it even worse, not only were they just, they had to be so reasonable about it. You know, I mean, what they said made so much sense. It was disgusting. I didn't want to be reasonable. I wanted sympathy. And I was hurt. And then they had the audacity to just cap it all off and say, someday you'll look back and thank God for this. I thought you've got to be out of your cotton-picking mind. But you know something? It happened. And even the deep valleys that we go through, if we walk on with Jesus, there'll come a day when we'll look back and thank God because it happened. Not that we enjoyed it, but that it showed us and taught us things we could have never learned any other way. And the first time that you use that terrible thing that happened to you to understand another person who's reaching out to you, and you look at them and you say, I know I went through something similar. I understand. 
Now let me tell you, God will fix it because he fixed it for me. And he doesn't love me, but he loves you. And you see hope spring into that person's eyes that maybe there is a way out. Then you're going to say, thank you, Lord. I never thought I'd thank you for that. But uh, I can see that. Now, the uh, woman says to Elijah, it also did something for the lady. She said, now by this I know thou art a man of God. Lord, I thought she already knew that, didn't you? But I guess the devil had really been aggravating her about it, you know. Well, you sure are. What a stupid woman you are, putting up with this man in your house, you know. What are the neighbors going to say? And uh, that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. It, it made a real solid believer out of her. Now, um, in the 18th chapter, in the first verse, it says, After many days the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and say, I'll send rain on the earth. And so Ahab went, on, uh, uh, excuse me, Elijah went to look for Ahab. And he, uh, of course, everywhere there was a drought. And there was a man who worked at the right hand of Ahab, a godly man who feared God. But he happened to be hooked into the system. He was a, a right-hand man to Ahab. And uh, he, uh, his name is Obadiah. And Ahab had sent him out with a bunch of the livestock from the palace and said take them and see if you can find water for them because uh, we're going to have to kill all the animals we're going to lose all our animals this drought this drought keeps up the water just drying up they've got to find pasture they've got to find water so Obadiah was out looking for pasture and guess who he found Elijah walked in and said hi there and he said uh, I want you to go and tell Ahab that uh, I won't see him and Obadiah said, now what do you want to do that for? So we've looked everywhere for you. Ahab has sent people everywhere and uh, couldn't find you. And he said, um, I just, what you're going to do, you're here, there, and yonder. And if I go tell Ahab you're coming to see him, then... Uh, and you'll just zoop and God will take you out and take you someplace else. He had a lot of faith in God and he believed Elijah was the prophet. And he said, then Ahab will kill me because I told him a lie. And uh, he said, no, I, I won't do that. He said, uh, verse, four, uh, verse 14, 1 Kings 18, Now thou sayest, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah's here, and he'll slay me, he'll kill me. I go in there and tell him I found Elijah and he comes and looks and you're not there. Elijah said, as the Lord of the host liveth, before whom I stand, I'll surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went on to meet Ahab and he told him about it. By the way, Obadiah, I think you'll find a little earlier there, that Obadiah was the man who was feeding a hundred prophets of God. He had them hid in two caves. Those boys were hiding out. They weren't helping Elijah any, but they were, they were there. They were prophets of the Lord, and Obadiah was slipping them food. And that was at the risk of his life, you understand. If Jezebel had known that, she'd have got his eye. Well, uh, he uh, goes to meet Ahab, verse 16, Obadiah does, and tells him Elijah, Ahab uh, told, him, uh, told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Came to pass, Ahab, when he saw him, he said, are you the one that troubled Israel? There you are, troublemaker. And Elijah said, it's not me that troubled Israel. You and your house, your father's house. You've forsaken the commandments of the Lord and you followed Baal. That's what's wrong with the country. But one of the first things you can always count on is that when you rattle the devil's cage, he's going to holler, foul, you're upsetting everything. I did have the distinction, I forgot to put it in the newsletter, that when I went to Indonesia this time, one month before I arrived, this official Assembly of God paper over there came out and was warning the people against Worley's dangerous teachings that were 
splitting and dividing the church. Well, I don't know how I divided their churches. I never was invited into one of them. I mean, I couldn't help it if their people heard about the meetings and came and got delivered. And I couldn't help it if they couldn't shut them up. You know, it's hard to shut somebody up who's lived in torment and fear and pain for years. And then when they get delivered and they go back to share the good news, there's a bomb in Gilead. God's got more than we've learned about. And uh, it gets awfully, awfully unpopular to be the one telling that. Some of you've learned that, haven't you? Yeah, I can see the look of, yeah, you're looking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you go back and you think, oh boy, this is the best news we ever heard. And they say, yeah, we'll toss you out on your ear. We don't want that kind over here. So he uh, is immediately accused of causing trouble to the nation. And Ahab's, uh, Ahab's charge is totally false. It wasn't Ahab troubling the nation. It was it wasn't Elijah, it was Ahab that was causing the trouble. It's not deliverance that's troubling the churches. It's folks that don't believe it. They've got the churches locked in paralysis and locked in power, a powerless struggle with the enemy, a hopeless struggle. Do you realize how hopeless, have you sat down and thought about it, just exactly how hopeless, completely hopeless the struggle what the devil is unless you have deliverance and spiritual warfare there is absolutely no way to win people it's a no-win situation without deliverance and the spiritual warfare that comes out of deliverance and the knowledge of the demonic kingdoms and how to destroy them is the only hope to break the paralysis on the church and that's why these severe and continued hatred and opposition to deliverance. It is not on theological grounds. It's not on personality grounds. Oh, you you'd think so. Hear some of them say, I don't like Worley. Look at him. <laughs> Who's he? Well, he's not anybody. He's a voice crying in the wilderness, if you will. Boy, it's a wilderness out there. Rudy feels like a voice in the wilderness over in Los Angeles. It's a big wilderness over there where he is. And you get called everything but something nice. But who cares? Were we saved in order to build a great reputation? Glorious religious structures? Our Savior made himself of no reputation. Where did this thing come about that we had to be popular with everybody? <clears throat> the early, early apostles were run out of just about every town they went to. They killed them all off. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. You'll find out. Every one of them ended up bad, except John. They tried to lower him into boiling oil, I think, one time. The fire went out and wouldn't burn him. He's the only one that died a natural death. All the rest of them, they punched swords in them. They drug them behind horses. They chopped their heads off. They put them between two horses and jerked them apart. And all kinds of neat things like that. You sure you want to follow Jesus? Am I not tempting you, you know, to run quickly to follow Jesus, huh? See, you don't hear much about this take up the cross because you're supposed to die. The cross is an instrument of death. When Jesus said take up the cross, he says take up the thing that's going to kill you. Think about that. Count the cost. You say, well, you're trying to scare people off. I can scare you off. The devil would run you the first time he rattled, or the first time he shook the bush, you'd run. But I can scare you. He'll scare you worse than that. You got to be rooted. You got to be know where your grounds are. You've got to know that you're rooted in the grace of God, or you'll never be able to stand. Never in a million years, friend. Never. Well, Elijah comes. And he said, I've got news for you. We're going to have a contest. You've got your established religious system. We're calling for a showdown. Call the priest of Jezebel, the priest of Baal. There's 450 of them. You call those priests and get them up there on top of Mount Carmel at a certain time. I'm going to meet you up there. You call the people and tell them to come together. We're going to have a contest. The God that answers by fire is going to be God. I don't really think that the priest of Baal 
leaped up and down and clicked their heels together and clapped their hands and said, oh boy, we're finally going to have a showdown with that stinker Elijah. I think they were scared out of their wits. I think Jezebel said, I'll stay home and pray for you boys. So she wasn't on the mountain. For some reason, she wasn't there. She wasn't taking any chances. Uh, that's kind of bad, you know. I mean, she's not trusting too heavy in her boys. She's got 950 before she gets through. She's got nearly 1,000 of them out there. 950 to 1, that's pretty good odds, isn't it? And, but they didn't dare avoid the confrontation because then they'd be admitting their God was false. They had to answer the charge. He's got them. Dead center. <laughs> and uh, so Ahab sent out all the children of Israel. He was, he was scared of Elijah. He was afraid of him. <laughs> he didn't really want to, but Elijah said, you get the people together. He said, all right, all right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he sent messages out. King says you're to be on Mount Carmel. So representations of people came, began to pour in. There's going to be a contest on Carmel. Well, if you want to have a, you want to have a, a big show out, announce there's going to be a fight on top of the mountain somewhere. And sure enough, there's a bunch of people showed up. Now, when they got there, they gathered together on Mount Carmel, verse 20. One says, Elijah came to all the people, and he must have had a voice like a foghorn. You know, he had a built-in loudspeaker. He didn't have one of these nice clip-on mics and uh, big speakers overhead. He had a built-in foghorn in him, and he let, he let fly, and he said, How long halt she between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. People answered him, not a word. He said, get off the stick. Either park it or drive it. You ever get along behind somebody that was about halfway parked in the lane you were driving in? You felt like saying, pull over and park or get out of the way. Let somebody go through that wants to go. Elijah said, I want you to quit trying to sit the fence. Some of you have been saying, well, you know, we don't exactly forsake God, but you know, Jezebel's outfit is nice too. And we just don't want to take a stand because, you know, we don't want to alienate our religious neighbors. Elijah said, it's time. Decide now. If God is God, follow him. If he's not, follow Baal. Quit dibbly dabbling around. And um, the people didn't say anything. And then Elijah said, I, even I, only remain a prophet to the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450. And then he gave instructions, let them kill two bullocks. I want you to choose one, for, I want them to take one of them for themselves. Cut it up in pieces and uh, put it on wood, put fire under it. I'll dress the other bullet, I'll lay it on wood, and I'll put no fire under it. And then, okay, boys, you Baalites, you get over and you call on the name of your God for fire, to burn the sacrifice. And said, the God that answers by fire, he'll be God. And all the people said, well, now that sounds good. Can you imagine consternation in Baal's camp? And then I imagine some of them thought, well, you know, I've seen the magicians work, you know, some real clever things, and we're safe, you know. This is kind of a hard test, but uh, they will answer. Because, you know, in witchcraft, they can do some strange things. They can make strange things happen, but not when it's a confrontation. Their powers are paralyzed in the presence of God. Well, they start out. They do what he said. They take the bullock, and they started out in the morning calling on the name of the Lord. Now, of course, they had 950 of them. They had just 450 from one place and then another 400 out of the groves or something. They ended up with 950 prophets. So they could kind of run them on in shifts, you know. And uh, when one bunch would get tired off, they'd run in and they'd start hollering. 
And I can just hear them in chanting, yeah, 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 oh, man, yeah, 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 yeah. We can hear that a uh, lot of chanting going on a lot of places these days. And uh, they were crying out and crying out. And they went all morning long. Now the sun's getting hot. The flies are swarming around that dead meat. Elijah's sitting over there. <laughs> oh, he was mean. He, uh, he said, well, uh, why don't you cry loud? Holler a little loud. They were so hoarse. Some of them got laryngitis from yelling. Hollering, you know. Oh, they hollered and hollered. Cause anybody knows that power is in the volume of your voice. If you holler a sermon, that means it's powerful. And if you put a holy hiccup on the end, boy, you're really in, you're really flowing in the spirit. What kind we won't mention. But uh, he said, cry aloud, for he's a God. And you'll have to holler real loud to get his attention. Oh, they could have cut his throat. Shut your mouth. And they yelled and yelled, you know, and he said, uh, maybe he's talking to somebody. You'll have to get his attention. Shut your mouth, Elijah. Oh, if we could just shut that man up. He's not content to embarrass us. He has to sit over there and holler at us all the time. Maybe he's off on a hunt. Maybe he's pursuing. <laughs> Yell a little louder. Maybe you can get through to him. Ooh. Oh, he said, well, maybe he's taking a nap. He's a heavy sleeper. Why don't you holler loud? You've been hollering for hours. Why don't you holler real loud? It ought to be time for him to get up by now. Ooh. You talk about frustration. Those boys began to dance a jig. They got hit by the dancing spirit. <laughs> they began to dance and jump. And then they took out their knives and they slashed themselves. They were slashing their bodies to shed their blood to please Baal so that he would throw fire to All they did was got all sore and bloody. And no fire. And that sun was hot. And the people watched. They thought, these are the boys that told us Baal could do everything. These are the boys that told us that Baal answers prayer. He not even paid no attention to them. And really, according to what they told us, Baal ought to knock Elijah off his perch over there because he's sitting over there laughing. I can just see Elijah sitting over there saying, <laughs> holler a little louder, boys. <laughs> try, try a little harder. Uh, come on now, you 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 getting tired there? Jump a little higher. Come on, come on, come up, 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 up. Maybe jump over the altar a few times, boys. Try that. Oh, he was after him. And uh, then people get mad at me because I have fun working with demons. <laughs> Listen, when the enemy is on the fryer cooking. That's exactly what Elijah did. Came to pass at noon, he mocks them. They're so tired and so hot. Remember, they've been jumping around and hollering for hours. And they still can't, can't produce. Then they began to cut with themselves with knives and lances and blood squirting everywhere. Their blood, trying to appease their God. And when the midday was past, they prophesied. Then they started, well, it's time to stop... <laughs> They got they so tired they couldn't wobble anymore. So they said, well, we're going to have prophesy. And they said, I prophesy the fire fall. Praise God, Bill, it's going to come. Everybody waited, no fire. Just flies. Big old flies buzzing around on that meat. All that dead meat laying up there, you know. And hot, oh my word. And they, they pro then one of the prophets said, well, it, our God is delaying for this purpose and that purpose, you know, but it's coming. Oh, just believe Baal. Just believe Baal, people. Believe him. They went on and on and on. Have you seen some of these kind of things? Not at Baal worship services? Where they got caught with their prophecies down? And they couldn't produce what they prophesied? 
Well, it goes on till the time of the evening sacrifice. That was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, lots of things happened at the time of the evening sacrifice. Jesus died on the cross at the time of the evening, evening sacrifice. You'll find some very significant things happened in the Bible at the time of the evening sacrifice. And here's one of them. And Elijah said, okay, <laughs> you boys have had it. Back off. Well, they were so tired, they didn't, they didn't have to talk to them much. They were pretty discouraged. I mean, after hours of jumping and screaming and hollering, a thousand men jumping around there hollering and screaming, nothing happened. It would be pretty discouraged. Would you be a little discouraged with your God? Well, they were too. Elijah told the people, come up close now, and I'm going to repair the altar of the Lord. And he put the stones together. Then he put the put 12 stones on one for every tribe. Because all the tribes were messed up. And then he built an altar and digs a trench around the altar. And then he uh, puts the wood on top. And then he puts the bullock, cuts him up, puts him on top. Now then he says, uh, I want four barrels of water. Now remember, we're in a place that's struck with drought. The only place for that water would be down that mountain and down in the lake down there. They're going to have to haul water all the way up the mountain. Four barrels. They went and got it. He said, what do you want to do with it? Pour it on top of it. Did you ever see her starting a fire by pouring water on top of it? Or what you going to try to burn? I didn't either. Those people hadn't either. Their eyes got big. Of course, the prophets of Baal kind of perked up a little, I think, about them. They thought, boy, he's done it now. <laughs> He'll never start that fire. No way. And he made them do it again. And he made them do it the third time. They had to haul 12 barrels of water up there and pour it on that. That, that wood was saturated. That, that calf was saturated. And that dirt and the stones. And it filled up the trench all the way around that. But he made them haul it up there. And pour it on there and soak her down. There wasn't going to be any little dinky doos going on with this. It's going to be the real thing. Sure enough, he stood up, and he doesn't go through any big rigmarole. Look, he he just uh, he stands up. Time of the evening sacrifice, verse thirty-six, and he comes and says, "The Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day, thou art God in Israel. I am thy servant. I have done all these things according to thy word. Hear, O Lord." Hear me, that this people may know thou art the Lord God, that thou hast turned thy heart, their heart back again. Then, that's not a very long prayer, is it? Then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, licked up the waters in the trench like, the trench, like it was gasoline. I mean, it ate up everything. It got the sacrifice, ate up all the wood burned up all the stones and even the dust and then got to licking up and, and took all the water. And there was a gas. You could hear a gas going over those thousands of people watching. And when the people saw it, they fell on their face and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Praise God. But the drought's not broken yet. Elijah's going to go up on top of the mountain. He tells Ahab. He goes to him. Now remember, it's still dry as a bone. There's no rain. There's not a cloud in the sky. And Elijah goes to Ahab and said, you better get in your chariot and run for your life, lest the rain overtake you. You're going to get caught in a flash flood on the way home. Does that take faith, fellas? Gals? Would that take faith to say that? That's what he told him. And there's no rain. He goes up on top of the mountain. He gets up there. And a lot of people have been offering things for God. But the sign that God was looking for was the sign of a man's knees in the sand. That's what Elijah gave him. Now, if you've ever had trouble going to sleep while you're praying, I want to give you Elijah's remedy for that. I used to go to conferences and get all stirred up, going to go and pray America back to God in one night, you know, things like that. Just going to stay on my knees till the fire fell, you know. And, you, get, you know, you get charged up and praise God, I'm just going to stay on my knees and I'm going to wrestle this thing through and get it through and about three in the morning I'd wake up I was so cramped I had gone to sleep and I was in 16 directions and oh 
I could hardly move. I almost screamed when I moved, you know. I was all cramped up. And I felt so carnal because here I'd slipped off to sleep when I determined I was going to step all night and pray. And I don't even, I don't remember I didn't get halfway around the world before I conked, you know. And, uh, but you could, uh, I heard some preacher say this. Now, he laid it on me, and naturally, the way I am, uh, I got interested, and I've had to try it out. And I'm going to lay it on you, and you'll, you'll get curious enough. You'll eventually try it out. And he said that if you have trouble going to sleep on your knees when you've determined to pray something through, the only thing you have to do is pray the way Elijah did on top of the mountain. Well, I got interested because I was sleepy head first when I was praying, you know. And uh, he said, just get out on your knees and put your head between your knees like he did. I thought, well, that doesn't sound too bad. Well, I wasn't quite as thick as I am now. But uh, at any rate, I managed to bend and put my head between my knees. Lord, have mercy. It's true. You will never go to sleep in that position. <laughs> your back will kill you. And there'll be so much pain, there's no possibility. And you'll get your praying done quick. I mean, you'll, get, you'll, you'll pray in a hurry, the biggest hurry you ever got into, trying to get out of that awful position. Law me, I don't know how. And I looked at Elijah again, I thought, that crazy fool did it seven times. But he, he dropped on his knees, put his head between his knees, and began to pray. And he sent his, after a while, he, he uh, got up and he sent his servant boy, said, go beyond and look over the, Look out over the sea and tell me what you see. The boy came back, said nothing. Okay. Down he went again, praying again. When he finished praying, he sent him out. He did this seven times. Each time the boy came back, six times he sent him out. The boy came back and said, there's nothing. The seventh time, the boy came back and he said, there's a cloud the size of a man's hand. It's rising out of the sea. Now, does that look like a cloud burst to you? That's a man's hand. That's what the boy saw. A cloud the size of a man's hand. Elijah said, my lands run. Quick! There's a gully washer coming. I think the boy couldn't understand the prophet. He thought, well, maybe he's flipped, you know. I don't know. And Elijah, now Ahab was already on his way in his chariot going home. And Elijah overtook the chariot and outran it going. I mean, he was stepping right along. And he was so excited. I mean, well, why wouldn't he be? He'd confronted the forces of darkness and God had vindicated his word and smashed them. Oh, I forgot to mention one little thing. He eliminated the opposition. He cut all their heads off. Ooh, you say, that's kind of bloodthirsty. That's the way God does things a lot of times. He's going to eliminate some opposition one of these days in a way that's going to shock a lot of these lovely little Christians that are so sweet that butter won't melt in their mouth. When God gets through with his judgments, they're going to say, our Lord is a God of war. He's a bloody God. And when people offend him to a certain degree, there's a place he gets to where he takes action that sheds blood. It's coming. I believe it's coming to that. And Elijah was running under supernatural power. But I'll tell you this, he was so happy, he was leaping and jumping, he outran Ahab getting there, and a messenger had run ahead and told Queen Jezebel what happened. Well, she had a message for Elijah. She felt led to tell him something. And uh, she sent a messenger to Elijah in uh, chapter 19, verse 2, and she said, let, so let the gods do it to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And did you know something? Here's my hero now. He, he just whipped the socks off of everything Jezebel could put up. And it knocked him off his pins. You know why? He's absolutely exhausted. He's drained physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. He is absolutely drained. 
And now the devil levels the haymaker and just says, I'll take you out, big boy. And he ran, he kept running, and he finally collapsed in a heap under a juniper tree. And then he got the poor meas. Now, of course, I know you've never had those, but it's a very prevalent disease. It attacks without warning. And uh, it, uh, it's prefaced with poor me, poor me, poor me. And he said, uh, uh, he, uh, he goes a day's journey in the wilderness now to hide from Jezebel. Wouldn't it have been great if he had said, let's go up there and see that old hussy. But he didn't. And I guess God wanted us to know he was human too. He might have been just too good if he'd have done that. But after he wins this tremendous victory, the devil lands a haymaker and almost takes him out. Let that be a warning to you. After mighty spiritual victories, after glorious explosions of God's glory and blessing, you are more vulnerable than you are at any other time. Your guards will be down. You'll be tired. You'll be rejoicing. You'll be happy. Ho, 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 ho. Bang! The devil will hit you and spin you for a lesson. You say, I'll teach you to rejoice. Be on guard. You're more vulnerable after victory than you are when you're fighting. When you're fighting, you're on guard. Every nerve is facing the enemy. When you win, you're, ha, 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 everything's great, you know. And that's when the devil comes. And that's what he did to him. And I lied, uh, Jezebel wasn't kidding. She intended to chop his head off. And he runs a day's journey into the wilderness, which makes him even more tired. And he sits under a juniper tree and requested for himself. He made a request. He, he had a good track record on prayer. So he figured he could get something from God. And he asked that he might die. And uh, he said, it's enough, O Lord. Take away my life. I'm not better than my father's. And he said, goodbye. And he lay down and he went to sleep. Uh, God, did he say, didn't God answer his prayer? Yeah. He just said, nope. And instead of giving him what he asked for, he gave him what he needed. He needed rest. He needed food. He's going to have, uh, he's going to sleep, he's going to sleep like the dead. And pretty soon, an angel's going to come and shake him, say, hey, get up the table set. God sent you a meal. You need something to eat. And he looked, and there was a cake baked on the coals he didn't cook. There was a cruise of water at his head. And he said, well, I am kind of hungry. So he wolfed down the food, and he lay down, and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord comes the second time in verse 7, said to rise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. He let him sleep some more, and then he fed him again. What's he doing? God's giving him something to eat and something to He's giving him rest. That's what he needed. He didn't need to die. He just needed to rest. So the next time that you're about to pass from this world and you're about ready to pick out your casket, try getting some sleep. Try stopping deliverance and pulling off somewhere and get some rest. And you'll be surprised how different the world will look when that's done. Now he ate and drank again, and that kept him going for 40 days. I'll tell you, I'd like to know the name of that restaurant, wouldn't you? Would you like to have a catering service with that restaurant? I mean, he ate a couple of meals from there, and it kept him going for 40 days then. Well, he comes on, and, and after this, by the way, after God gets him rested back on his feet, God gives him a new revelation of himself. And we don't have time to go into that. They're red lighting me already. And, uh, but we're going to, he gets a new revelation of God, a new understanding of God. 
And God informs him, among other things, that he does have 7,000 have bailed the need to bail. Now, that's not many among the thousands that were in the land, but God did have a few reserved, and he's always got his few. He's never left himself without a remnant. But the Elijah ministry that's not afraid to die, that'll risk everything on following God and obeying God, that's the one thing, the only thing that Jezebel fears. He also gave him a prophecy later. He comes and prophesies the death of Ahab, who dies pretty quickly. And then he prophesies Jezebel's death, and hers is delayed for 20 years. She gets to think about it for 20 years before she passes. And sure enough, the dogs eat her alive. Eat her, well, she's not alive when they get through with her, but uh, she hit the ground, and the dogs ate her body. And I tell you people, it's worth it all to be caught in the everlasting arms of God, to be walking in His way, isn't it? Now, we're living in dreadful times, and don't kid yourself that we're not living in times that things could get bloody and very dangerous for those who stand for the truth. Arm yourself with that. Be prepared to die for Jesus, and if you don't, you can live for Him. How's that? If you're prepared to die, then you'll also won't be afraid to live. Okay? Trouble with some Christians, they've been prepared to live. They think they're going to live for Jesus. When the devil says, I'm going to kill you, it scares the daylight out of them. If you prepare to die, then you can live. Amen? This has been a production of the Hegwish Baptist Church and is available for sale. For further information about this tape or other videotapes, write to the Hegwish Baptist Church, 8711 Cottage Grove Avenue. Highland, Indiana, zip code 46322, or call area code 219-838-9410.